We're going to start a, um, a new series. I don't know how long it will be, but um, it'll be about what the Bible tells us we must do. Things that are a necessity for people to do. And I got to thinking about it, and I thought that, you know, um, we have so many people that say they don't understand the Bible, and I thought, well, there's a lot of things in the Bible that tell us what we need to do. Uh, there, In fact, it's not need to do. It, it is absolutely imperative that we do these things. So we're going to look at that. And... Um, we're going to start with John chapter 3, verse 3. And um, this verse says, Jesus, <coughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless, and in Greek that's the word eon me, uh, unless anyone be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we do ask for your help in understanding your word. We ask for your help in applying your word. And uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Surprisingly, God is very clear about his expectations toward us if we want to live with him forever. Um, there's really uh, no confusion, no cloudiness. Um, and the reason that I, I say this, that it is a surprise, is because there are so many that say first that it's not so, the Bible's difficult to understand, it's contradictory, and of course we know it's not. Anybody that studied God's Word knows it's not. Um, but we also have a multitude of interpretations of the Bible and uh, lots of religions and lots of denominations that call themselves Christians. So, uh, in order to do this, let's start first with what God says about himself. And I got three scriptures here that, that I want to read. First one is in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Now right there it tells us two things. People lie, <laughs> which we know, and people, all people, need to repent. God is not a man, so therefore he doesn't need to do that. And there's only been one man that's been perfect, and that's his son. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? And, uh, and the obvious answer is, is whatever God has said, he's going to do it. And uh, whatever he's promised, he will make it good. He'll do it. He'll carry it through. All right, another scripture about, and again, this is God speaking about himself. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. <clears throat> That's interesting too. And again, the em emphasis here is the creator of all that there is and all life that there is he does it right the first time which is something that uh, we humans don't seem to be able to do and then in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge and laying hold of the hope set before us. And of course, the hope set before us is, again, the promises of God. He says, if, you've trusted, if you will trust in my Son, 
uh, that you will have eternal life. But the thing about it is, is what do all these words mean to trust? Um, so there are some things that we need to look at here. Going back to John chapter 3, verse 3, where Jesus is telling Nicodemus, um, twice he says amen, which means it's true. That's, in fact, if when churches used to say amen to the preacher, uh, what it meant was, that's true, that's right. Um, so when Jesus says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless anyone be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, the question comes, well, why is this mandatory that people be born again? Well, Jesus explains it. And he does so three verses later in John chapter 3, verse 6. And this is what he says. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been born of the Spirit is spirit. And of course, he's talking about being born of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. You see, to live with God requires us to be like Him. Well, what does the Bible tell us about God besides the one verses that we already read that he doesn't lie? Well, first off, God is spirit. The very next chapter in John chapter 4, verse 24, uh, Jesus says, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And there's that word must. Dei, D-E-I. Um, in Greek, that word means of necessity. It is something that has to be done. Um, since God is spirit and he lives forever, for us to live with him, we must take on that characteristic of life as a spirit also. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we don't have flesh, but it's a different kind of flesh. It is a spiritual flesh. Yes, you can touch it. Yes, you can feel it, but it is not like this decaying, decrepit flesh that we have. And I guess if I'm talking to somebody young, they don't realize they're decaying or decrepit. Most don't, but uh, you are. So, first requirement is to be like God because he's spirit. But there's a second thing about God that we read in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. God can't approve of evil or sin. Now, what this says, and I'm going to tell you, it says, Thine eyes are too pure to approve evil. Now, a lot of English translations say look on evil. But the word look on in means to approve of it. To see something and approve of it. In other words, to stare intently. To continue to approve of what you're seeing. God can't do that. He won't do that. He's pure. And that's what Habakkuk says. And thou canst not look on wickedness with favor. So that's the whole idea. For God to entertain continually looking at you and me in our, con our present condition for all eternity, he couldn't do that. He has to change us. That means we have to be transformed. And the interesting thing is, when we want to transform something, um, for example, I just stopped by uh, a new antique store today on the way over to our prayer meeting. And uh, the interesting thing is most antiques, uh, they, they don't look exactly the way that they did when the, somebody picked them up. They have to clean them up, dust them off, 
maybe sometimes paint them. Now, I know there's a lot of people who say, oh, you've ruined the value of it if you've done that. Well, yeah, that's, that's an idea. But most people don't want something that's dirty sitting in their house. And isn't that interesting? God's the same way. He doesn't want us who are dirty sitting in his house. So he's got to change us. Now, this all sounds, I know, kind of impossible to a lot of people. And uh, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 to 26, it sounded impossible to Jesus' disciples too. And Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, I say to you, that with difficulty a rich man will enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples, having heard this, they were exceedingly astonished, saying, Then who is able to be saved? You see, they always figured that rich people, God smiled on them, kind of like the Presbyterians said. And, uh, you know, that's what their great teacher, the lawyer, taught everybody. Hey, uh, rich guy, God's favored. No. Okay. Uh, but looking on them, Jesus said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, the other side of the coin comes from the Christmas story. Where the angel Gabriel, and by the way the word angel means messenger, the messenger Gabriel told Mary, Luke 1, 37, for anything will not be impossible with God. Don't you love that? On the one hand, God says everything, he tells us everything is possible with him. But on the other side of the same coin, we hear that anything is not impossible with God. I, I like that because while it's saying the same thing, it answers critics on two accounts. One account is, a lot of people will say that, uh, 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 well, God can't do everything. On the other hand, people will say uh, that there are things that are impossible for God. And the fact of the matter is, both those ideas, those ways of thinking, God contradicts right out of his word. All is possible. Nothing is impossible. So, with your situation that you're dealing with today, it, it's not impossible for God to solve it. And for whatever you're looking at that you dream of, if that's in accordance with God's will, then that can be done. But back to this idea of must. I want you to please note this. God is the one who has done all the heavy lifting, as it were. A lot of people say, oh, well, you know, when, you're, when you uh, are moving, and I've done a lot of moving in my life, um, if you have a, a moving company, the guys that are there to take things out of the house and put it in the truck and then take it out of the truck and put it wherever you want it when you get there, uh, you let those guys do the heavy lifting. You might take a box or two yourself, but, uh, but they do the heavy lifting. Well, God has done the heavy lifting. And you say, what's that? Well, we cannot save ourselves. God's done that. We do not know everything. In fact, nowhere near do we know everything. That's always what kind of gets me when I'm listening to somebody who acts like they think they know everything. We are broken. And for those that are honest with themselves, they acknowledge, yes, I'm broken. 
was, isn't it wise to take that which is broken to the one who made you? Take it to the maker to get fixed? Because the broken item can't fix itself. And there's another thing. We have a very dangerous enemy. And what he wants to do is he wants to seek our destruction. He knows we're broken. He wants to see us thrown in the dump. By the way, that's hell. Doesn't that call for a must-do on our part? Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would help us to see the must-dos in your word. Realizing that all the work you've done, the must-do is to surrender to you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.